Welcome to the Edelheit Experience, a compelling conversation about revolutionizing health and well being, bringing you rich stories and lessons learned from leading corporate executives. Now, we'd like to introduce your host, Jonathan Edelheit. Welcome to the Edelheit Experience. This is Jonathan Edelheit. I've got Laura Kirk with us today. Laura, thank you for joining us. Sure. Thanks for having me. So can you uh, give uh, our listeners a little background on uh, who Laura is? Great. Sure. So I'm Laura Kirk. I am currently the director of Total Rewards at Radial. I've really spent my entire career in various roles within benefits and have added on compensation later in, in my career. I've worked in a host of different industries. I've worked across various company sizes, and I've really touched all aspects of employee benefits from traditional health and welfare programs to retirement programs, well-being programs. And then in the last several years, I've really taken a focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, so I'm so excited to, to be speaking with you today, Jonathan. So thanks for, for inviting me. Thanks for joining us. I think it's cool that you've worked in, in all these companies of these different sizes and these different roles, because it's probably just given you a very unique perspective on everything. Yeah, it's been great um, in my career to really be able to build on and see how different organizations operate and just the importance of making um, benefits and well-being programs fit into the culture of the organization that you're with. So what, what have you seen how well-being and benefits has really evolved? What's that evolution that you've seen? And I, I guess over your career, where do you see it evolving to? Yeah, I think it's been really interesting. I, you know, it started off early in my career really with a keen focus on well-being programs. And I had done some certifications. And it just it, at that time, we were just so focused on if we could just tell people that they had these areas that they needed to improve, that they needed to exercise or eat better. If we could just let them know and have them focus on it, then they would just, they would know to do it and they would do it. And that was really the birth of the health risk assessment. And, and then we found that people weren't doing the health risk assessment. So we added on an incentive. Well, if we just, we paid them something, then they do it and they'd learn all of this information and they'd be able to go and do it. And then we found that they weren't doing that. And so we started to add on these, you know, programs over the years and adding in um, different incentives. And what we found is that people do what we're asking them to do to earn the incentive or while we're giving them the incentive but that it doesn't actually result in any kind of lasting change. And so, you know, I really think where the, the, it, it's a, it, we're at a really interesting uh, uh, position in history, right, within well-being to, to see the program start to evolve, to meet people a bit more where they are with this recognition that we need to take a holistic approach, that the reason that somebody's making different choices around food is, is related to finances and it's related to the individuals in their household and it's related to how you know certain foods make them feel or remembrances from their past and all of those things just make it so much more complex um, to address. And so where I, I see this space going and where we need to continue to evolve to is where it becomes a part of um, the social connection and we actually have to change overall culture and, and how we, how we, we interact with others and, and get that support and build up that, that social support system to be making different choices than what we've made in the past. So I love that you mentioned social connection, because I feel like that is so key. Um, and I also feel with the last couple of years of the pandemic, you know, one, everyone needs a social connection, but two, I think we learn a lot um, and, and our habits are picked up from who we're socially with. How, how do we approach that? Because I feel like a lot of well-being programs don't have that component. And a lot of the employers I've talked to have all been trying to solve this in their own way and basically just pilot different things. Yeah, I don't think we've solved it yet, right? Um, and I think that that's where a lot of these pilots come into. I think there are a few things that employers could think about doing now, and some of it is expanding their programs to reach more than just the employees. So if you're going to put together some kind of well-being program, how do you involve a person's support network? So whether you open it up similar to how EAP programs typically work, where it's the whole household that you're encouraging participation for, 
or if you're at least um, it, uh, expanding it to just those that are covered on your, under your plans that would include dependents and others that in, in theory are a part of that support, that support network. Other ways employers have tried to address it, um, and is another great way, is trying to build some of that social support and connection right at the workforce, right? So who else is sitting next to those employees? Who's, who's on their teams and, and, and trying to create some of those programs that way? Where, those, where that falls apart a bit is when you go home, right? Or when you're on vacation or when you're away from those individuals that you work with. So really, we need to figure out a better way of, of drawing some of those connections from the personal to the work. But to your point, the pandemic has been super helpful because people have been working from home more often and you're able to connect virtually through a computer screen and get support that way, as well as being at home. And there's opportunity there for us to connect in those programs to um, the, the reality that employees are spending more time at home, even within their workday. I, I like you mentioning the holistic approach. I actually read a study that just uh, this morning that just came out by Tufts University, and it was about how seven percent of U.S. adults have good cardio metabolic health, and that it was sharing kind of how our health as a society has kind of really gone downhill, or you know, and continues downhill. I think the, the study showed like forty percent of people almost 20 years ago had diabetes. Now it's 60%, 33% had a healthy weight. Now it's 25%. Are, you know, are, like, what do we need to do to like lose the battle or change the game holistically if what we've been doing historically over the last 10 to 20 years isn't kind of changing the curve? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I think it has to start extending beyond just employer programs. I mean, we've been trying um, and putting out programs and trying to support employees, but so much of it is our external culture. It's there's just so much that needs to evolve. It's just so much more complicated, right, than a simple um, HR program. But I do think some of it is education. An arm is education. An arm is the employer. An arm is just the the foods that are available within our markets that it really, it, it has to be a much more um, broad and holistic um, view where everyone is committed to, to trying to tackle this together. But there's small steps, right? There's still small steps that employers can take. So can we do more walking meetings? I mean, if, if our focus is just trying to get people to move more, are there things that we, we could focus on as an employer? And those small steps that we, we could choose to take, whether it's, it's food or um, nutrition, you know, can we provide free lunches to, to employees that are, that are um, healthier? So there are things we can take, but if we really want to move the needle, it has to be broader than just an employer program. Mm -hmm. No, I completely agree with you. And it's complex. There is no easy answer. Uh, and it, it probably gets more difficult each year as our, you know, as companies, as individuals, I feel like everything is, um, how we reach people, the, the free time, the mental capacity we have to be open to things becomes more complex. Absolutely. And as things change just in our economy or, you know, things like COVID that really changed the game of what, even where employers were focused, we were finding this like drastic shift to trying to support the emotional well-being of our employees and the social connection pieces away from a focus on physical health of eating healthy and exercising. And so as we head into what potentially could be some kind of um, uh, economic downturn, you know, what the results of that are going to be and where, what the struggles are of our employees and our members and how we, how we focus to support them will shift a bit, even in how uh, employers are prioritizing and what they're prioritizing. Yes. It's, uh, I feel like the needle keeps moving. For me during the pandemic, you know, I ended up hurting my back. And it was all, I think a year and a half in, and it was, I call it because of atrophy because of the pandemic. Like I was, wasn't going to the gym, you know, and then all of a sudden I was like, ah, you know, I really understand the value of employers offering MSK solutions now, you know, and now much more active than I was before. Um, but there's so many of these outside factors that come in and influence what we're able to do and the stress that we have. When, when we look over at, I know DEI, is you know something personal to you yeah, you're very passionate about like where 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 are you personally headed on this journey and and what should other 
people in similar role, roles be? Yeah, I don't know if you have any guidance or advice for them. Yeah, it's definitely been something that's been a, a personal journey of mine and you know, really started with listening and seeking out resources to learn. And that that would be if if you're not feeling personally passionate about it today, that to me would be the the right place to start is just trying to educate yourself on why are we talking about this in the first place? For me, that that was the the turning point. And it it started to help me question for myself how I have contributed to or not contributed to inequalities in in our society overall. And the timing for me was perfect because that also became a very important discussion within employers. And uh, I was able to really marry up some of my personal conviction with what we were looking at within the employer space. Specific around healthcare, I think there is a lot, a lot of work that we need to be doing. It's just the delivery of healthcare, how we structured it has just, it's, it's been in existence for so long that there are, there are just um, systemic in, um, inequities that are just built into the system that we're just, we're just not even aware of because we have not peeled back the onion yet to really uncover that. And so that to me is the next big place that we need to be focused as, as employers as, and pushing insurance carriers. Um, to really start to look at all of their policies and programs to put that DEI lens onto it and really start working towards having um, healthcare equality and, and equal access um, and really be focused on, on delivering programs that help people get connected to proper healthcare. Mm-hmm. I, I love that because I think the one thing in one of our previous conversations for one of the panels at Healthcare Revolution Conference is when you start, I feel like looking under the engine or looking under the hood of the car in this area and you start identifying you know specific things then i think it becomes more eye opening of the tie in of like dei and health and well-being um and some of the things that you know came up were you know does somebody have a car you know do they have access to go get the care i know one example at our, from healthcare revolution was the issue of uh, you know employers offering fertility but you know, someone maybe not having you know the money or the car to go to the fertility clinic or to pay some of those initial costs, and and you know I would love you know for you to share some insight you know to those listening, like what are some of those questions that they should ask, or maybe they just never thought of it before because they didn't put themselves in other people's shoes of you know how they need to be looking at this in certain examples that may then help bring them bring it home, and then they could start looking at that across their whole program with that lens or those optics. Yeah, absolutely. And really the family planning space, um, it's gotten a lot of attention, but there's there's definitely a lot of um, kind of systemic inequities within programs that that to me is a bit of like low hanging fruit, easy to kind of look at the program and start to take the lens that whatever my family makeup, if I want to have children, how do I get there? And does my program offer support for that. So whether it's surrogacy, it's adoption, it's seeking out um, infertility services, and how does someone actually go through the journey? So, you know, take take a different, um, each different kind of family planning situation and run that through your program and see what the output is. You know, we, what we had found when we started to do that, and, and this is what we had talked about, um, healthcare revolution was you know, some a same-sex couple had to have an infertility diagnosis to leverage the infertility benefit, which meant they had to spend out of pocket to even have rounds of artificial insemination to get that um, that diagnosis. So when you start to to walk through what the experience is, then you can start to see where it it becomes unfair. Um, the other thing that that you know we've been looking at most recently is is you had talked about like access. Had someone actually have either an infertility provider within distance or any providers that they can actually get to a car with transportation? And as we've like looked to control costs within the healthcare space, we've 
we've gone about you know some of these limited network programs where it's great because we're like focusing on providers that have high cost and high quality but now employees have have less access or less choice um, to providers and for some employees it's removing access because they maybe could have taken a bus to get to another provider that was in the network but now they have to go see someone else where they they can't get to um, via bus and so really try starting to take the lens that okay if i don't have a car can i can i get access to care and what access can i get if you know and start to think through those different scenarios and situations within your employee population and and those inequities will will arise but you need to start realizing that that these these um, situations exist within your populations. Something that you said earlier reminded me of that too when you're talking about, or you know, you know, two two employees. And I was thinking of some companies who are thinking, you know, my employees can go, you know, go take, you know, take a wellness break. Let's say, you know, a lot of people are still working remotely. Take a wellness break. Go walk in a park, or that they have access to healthy food. But some people may not have a park to walk in, or they may have not have a car in the local place they get. And a lot of companies haven't really walked through this and they're you know just approaching everything with a one size fits all of what options versus really digging down into the you know the demographics of their employees and how they can help them address some of these issues absolutely and really taking that deep dive of looking at where your employees are located and starting to look at yeah like grocery store access where are your employees doing their shopping what kinds of um, fresh produce is even available. What kinds of cultural makeup is your population? So you're putting out, you know, healthy recipes that don't even, they just don't resonate because that's not how your people eat or what your people are typically used to eating or feeding to their families, right? You've got to like figure out how to meet your employees where you are. And I, I feel like that's, that's the personalization that we're all used to um, from, from all of the, the wonderful companies Googles and Amazons that are constantly personalizing. But if we really want to get behavior change, if we really want to want to help connect with our employees and be able to bring them along on a healthier journey, one that is more fair and equitable, we have to be willing to meet them where they are and understand their struggles and situation. Do you feel that the vendors and solutions are they are they there you know are they you know is the industry way behind do they have a lot of catching up to do in in creating that those innovative solutions that help you know you meet those needs i think we have a ways to go i mean i think that a lot of the um solution providers and they a lot of the focus has been on um creating an engaging app or some kind of website that's that's gonna gonna get there um, without even thinking through like data usage and how we connect with employees that are using track phones. And uh, we, we just, we have so far to go in really thinking through our employee populations, really digging in and understanding um, all of the different factors that impact them. And I just, I think that um, it, we, we just for so long have operated at a bit the macro level where we're just we're looking at summarized data and and there's value to that but we need to start going deeper and some of the vendors don't even have the ability to go as deep as we need them to go right so i i, I do think we have a long way to go how how deep do we need to go and then is there is there one thing that you would love whether it's it's a company in the space or someone new emerges to tackle like one thing that would be you you just feel would be empowering for you so i <laughs> I think we need to be comfortable going deep down to the individual level. If we, if we really want to have the greatest impact, we need to personalize and get down to that individual motivation, individual connection um, to, really, to really have, have the impact. You know, I, in this space, I think a vendor that's really able to differentiate and isn't just talking about employee profiles and trying to bucket people, but really like a communications vendor that can truly personalize and has enough profiles that they can like really get at, at an individual and be able to tailor and personalize um, down to that individual level to be able to connect 
um, more deeply, that that is going to be a game changer for the entire industry. You know, we, we have the technology exists because the, the Googles and the Amazons are already doing it, right? So it's, it's taking that, that kind of technology and bringing it into the employer healthcare space where you can really be personalizing down to what my needs are and reaching me at a deeper level. I completely agree with that. I think it's the only way you're going to actually get anyone to engage or get a change in behavior, you know, that this without being able to somehow connect with that person. And the only way to that is that deep dive, understanding that person and delivering personalized well-being or healthcare to them and messaging. Absolutely. Yeah. As, as we wrap up, any, uh, any other insights or words of wisdom that you'd love to share? I'd say it's, you know, it's an evolution and a journey. I do think, um, as I had said early, it's, earlier, it's an exciting time to be a part of in, in employer benefits. I think there's a, there's a lot of opportunity and, and a lot of evolution happening, and it's all about continuing to make progress. So continuing to, to learn and grow and make, make, bring about new technologies. And, you know, I just, I, it, like I said, it's, it's just an exciting time to be a part of uh, these programs. I agree. I agree. And uh, it's, it's, you know, I, I think with the challenges that we face more now than we ever did before, it also, while it creates a lot more stress in our roles of having to deliver results for employees, it also creates this challenge that it's fun, you know, to do something that's going to have an impact. Absolutely. Well, thank you for joining us, Laura. Thanks for having me.